Thank you, Larry. And welcome to worship here at the Monroe Congregational Church. We're so glad that you can join us, either here in person or virtually. Thanks to our Deacon of the Day, Caleb, um, and our featured musician, Larry, who's playing for us today on the cello. I'd like to thank everyone for their support at last night's wine and beer tasting. Uh, the proceeds will be split between Nourish Bridgeport, which is a feeding program that is run out of the United Congregational Church. They feed about 250 individuals. And the Geraldine Johnson Elementary School in Bridgeport, uh, where we are going to help fund health and wellness supplies for the 800 students there. So thank you so much to Kathy and the rest of the team and all of your support, to Roy, for his contribution, and of course, Voracious. Thank you so much. We hope that you can join us for a time of fellowship outside on Pierce Lawn, courtesy of Fellowship and Friends. You are also welcome to join our Zoom coffee hour later at 11.30 this morning, which is hosted by Arlene. There is a meeting code that can be found in the bulletin or in your weekly email. I bet Julie would like to talk to us a little bit about crop walk. Right? Okay. Come on up. Come up here. Speak right into the mic. Good morning. Good morning. Crop Walk helps our neighbors locally, nationally, and internationally to overcome hunger, poverty, displacement, and disaster. In 2019, Crop supported families in 55 countries emphasizing self sustaining agricultural pro projects. Now in 2020, the global pandemic has exacerbated an already dire situation for many. In a matter of mere months, the coronavirus has wiped out global gains that took two decades to achieve, leaving an estimated two billion people at the risk of abject poverty. Please see one of our walkers this year. Our, our team MCC is made up of Christina Logan, Jeanette Cardenti, Kate and Don uh, Parker Burgard, Chuck and Bonnie Schneider, and me. Uh, we'll see you outside at coffee hour. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Today from two to four, the Monroe Playground Foundation is holding an ice cream fundraiser on the green. So if you'd like to attend, please bring a picnic uh, blanket or you can drive through the takeout. Masks and social distancing rules are in effect. Are there any other announcements for the good of our community this morning? Well, thank you, friends. I know that sometimes life seems so complicated, and it would take ages to tell the whole story. So as we tune our attention to worship this morning, May we be reminded that we stand in the long arc of God's story, surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, so we need not bear the weight alone. So whether you carry dreams fulfilled or hopes dashed, whether you are feeling alone in the world or surrounded by friends, whether today brings delight or uncertainty, each one of us is called with love and purpose. Come, let us worship. one another with the peace of Christ.
friends, today marks the beginning of an important journey. In the baptismal promises we make as a faith community, we agree to grow with our young people, to help them and their parents on their journey of faith. Confirmation is a process by which these young people choose whether to affirm their baptism and become adult members of this church and Christ's universal church. It's also a process in which parents begin to allow their children to make mature faith decisions on their own. And so we joyfully celebrate the beginning of this journey with the new members of our 2021 confirmation class. Hannah, Emma, Owen, Bella, and Julia, I invite you to please stand where you are with your parents whether you are tuning in online or here in person, so that you may receive your study Bible and remain standing while we make some promises together. So please rise. Parents, do you promise your continued love, support, and care as your children explore what it means to be a Christian and a member of the church? Will you support them as they begin to mature in faith, taking more and more responsibility for their own spiritual journey? If so, please answer, I do, with the help of God. Will the congregation please rise, if comfortably able? Members and friends of the Monroe Congregational Church, United Church of Christ, will you show these young people examples of Christian love Will you support them through your prayers and interest? Will you care for them by sharing your time and experience in the faith? If so, please answer, I will, with the help of God. I will, with the help of God. Confirmance. Today marks the beginning of a commitment to grow and learn. Soon, you will explore questions about God, Jesus Christ, the Bible, the church, and the Christian faith. You have heard the promises of your parents and the congregation who are standing by your side. With this support, do you promise to attend worship regularly, in person or online, to prepare and participate when asked, and to support each other along the way as best you are able? If so, please answer, I will with the help of God. Let us pray our unison prayer. Gracious God, bless these confirmants on their journey. May they grow in knowledge and faith. Guide them with your spirit and show them the love and peace of Christ that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now I'm going to invite everyone but our confirmants to please take a seat. As Caleb and I will distribute your study Bibles. We continue now in a time of prayer as our community comes together with joys and concerns. 
I ask you to please keep in your prayers Bob and his family on his decision to end chemo treatments. We pray for Bob. Are there other names to be lifted before God, perhaps ones not already found in our bulletin today? Your cousin Jen passed away. May God be with your family on that loss. Yes, thank you. Your friend Pat with leukemia, we pray. Thank you. Anne. Prayers of healing for Pat, Gerald, Roberta, and Lisa. Pat, Gerald, Roberta, and Lisa, prayers of healing. Thank you. Marion. In loving memory of Nils. In loving memory of Nils Weiberg, who passed away a year ago. I've been thinking of him a lot lately, missing him. Yes, Kathy. For Priscilla and Sharon, healing and strength. Yes, Jen. For Dave. For Dave, we pray. Yes, Gay. Prayers for the family of Fran. For Fran's family, we pray. We lift in prayer. Yes, June. Shirley, who has leukemia. For Shirley, with, you, with leukemia, we pray. Jessica. Prayers of strength and healing for my friend Katie. For Katie, strength and healing. Yes. Uh, for my friend Nancy, who has just received a kidney transplant. For Nancy with a new kidney transplant, we pray. Friends, let us hold these, these concerns in our hearts as we continue now with the moment of silent prayer. God of all the earth, we call on you because we know you will answer. Hear us now. It seems some days like the powers of this world are working together, making plans against the well-being of your beloved people. We pray that the forces of division that set the strong against the weak are abated. Reveal your enduring strength that rises up within human communities. Send us a word of hope. When insecurity and uncertainty drive us to despair, restore us, join us to one another. Be with those on our hearts today whom we have lifted up before you. Drive away everything that takes away joy. Send forth the healing power of your love. And let all the world know the grace of your reign. For you alone are the sovereign of all. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we bring our gifts today, praying that as we practice the art of giving, as ourselves, as a sign of our gratitude, that God would make us even more generous. We're empowered to look beyond our sense of scarcity and toward the blessing that God is pouring out, blessings of peace and love for ourselves and others. Thank you for the ways that you give to keep us whole as a community in honor of the bounty of creation and the Spirit's gifts of talent and skills. We bring our offerings as a sign of our deep gratitude in Christ's name. Our offering plate today may be found at the hospitality table as you leave our worship. You may also choose to give online at www.mcc-ucc slash donate. Thank you.
you, Larry. Friends, since we heard about God's promise to Abraham last week, both Hagar and Sarah bore sons to him. And each was promised to become a great nation. Their names were Ishmael and Isaac. And the story of the Hebrew Bible continues through the lineage of Isaac, who married Rebekah and became the father of Jacob and Esau. Jacob was born a trickster and a dreamer all his life. So with a pot of soup, he bought his brother's birthright, and later he tricked their father out of Esau's blessing. When running away for his life, he dreamt of angels coming and going from earth on a ladder. And after marrying sisters Leah and Rachel, he and Esau eventually reconciled, and Jacob dreamt again of wrestling with God and coming out the other side with a blessing and a new name, Israel. Now Jacob had four wives and 12 sons, and who knows how many daughters, as they typically didn't really include the girls in the genealogical record. The youngest two sons were the only children born by Rachel, who had always been Jacob's favorite and truest love. So we pick up the story today in Genesis chapter 37, reading verses 1 through 8 and 17 through 36, and then skipping to the end of the brother's story in chapter 50. I'm reading from the New Standard Revised Version, and a copy is found in your bulletin to follow along if you so wish. Now Israel loved loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age. And he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his father, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. And once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. There were these binding sheaves in the field, and suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. And then your sheaves of grain gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? So they hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. The man said, they have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, he conspired to kill him. They conspired to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered them out, delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him in this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. Then Judah said to the brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes. He returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where can I turn? Then they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They had the long robe with sleeves taken to their father, and they said, This is, this we have found. See now whether it is your son's robe or not. He recognized it and said, This is my son's robe. A wild animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments 
put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned his son for many days. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. So this morning, we have the story of Joseph a full-of-himself younger brother, I've got one of those, his ten jealous and angry older brothers. Add in a little betrayal, famine, political intrigue, parental favoritism, and a kidnapping. The ratings on this Jerry Springer episode of the Bible would be epic. And now back in those days, you know the oldest brother, the oldest son, really, was always the favored child, standing to inherit all the family's wealth and status, but not in this family. We learn that in this family, the father, Jacob, loved Joseph the most. He was, as the text puts it, his son of his old age, born from the favorite of his four wives. And he showed his preference in many ways, the most obvious was the gift that he gave, an expensive coat, the kind with long sleeves that every hip Middle Eastern young man dreamed to have at that time, which causes among his older brothers a jealousy that turns to hatred, that turns to rage. At 17, Joseph had some dreams that one day the entire world, including his brothers, would bow down at his feet. And Joseph, he was just dumb or arrogant enough to tell his brother about those dreams, which is sort of like pouring lighter fluid on a smoldering campfire. It only inflamed their hatred. And this growing animosity compelled them to kidnap him and fake his death and sell him into slavery, which is how Joseph became a servant to an important official in Egypt. They rip up the coat, cover it in animal blood, and bring it to their despondent father. And for almost 40 years, their father Jacob feels the pain of that loss. And for almost 40 years, Joseph couldn't feel his father's love because of what his brothers chose to do to him. So you know what I'd be doing in his place, right? I'd be nursing my grudge. I'd be fantasizing about how to get back at them once I learned about their trickery, but not Joseph. No, he kept focusing forward. Eventually, Joseph is released from his captivity and through some miraculous circumstances, becomes the Pharaoh's most trusted official. And this is when he performs his greatest feat. Guided by God, Joseph had the foresight to stockpile massive amounts of grain during seven years of an abundant harvest. And what follows is seven years of famine, during which Egypt is prepared to feed the world, growing wealthier in the process. And it was during that time that Joseph's starving brothers went to Egypt seeking food. And his brothers didn't recognize him as they bowed and they begged before him, but Joseph recognized them. If revenge is sweet, 
he was standing in the doorway of a candy store. With just a word, he could have had all of them imprisoned or sold into slavery or even tortured or executed. It was in his power to do so, but he didn't. Joseph didn't pick at that emotional scab. He let that pain fade away years ago. He wasn't focused on what evil had been done to him. Instead, he was focused on the good that God had done through him in the time since. He learns from his brothers that his father is still alive. And although their time together will be short, there's a chance to make up for that which had been lost. The possibility to be reunited fills his eyes with tender tears. Dad said you should forgive us. The brothers cower in fear. Joseph responds, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. Now replace that word intended with the word weaved, because that is the meaning of the word in Hebrew. In effect, Joseph was saying to his brothers, I know that you were trying to weave a thread of pain into my life, but that's okay, because God took that thread and wove it into my life and made something beautiful with it. God used it for good. Joseph is willing to overlook the past and move on. And have you ever looked at the backside of a tapestry? It's usually a mess of threads and knots with very little discernible pattern. But when you turn it over and you look at the front, all you see is the beauty and the order. And I think that's one of the things this story is trying to teach us. Throughout life, we will have choices. And things happen for a reason we can't fully understand at the time, and we may never. We can focus on what the people and the circumstances beyond our control have done to us and choose to focus on the pain, but that's like looking only at the backside of the tapestry. All we will see is ugly, which makes us feel bitter and disillusioned. Or we can choose to focus on what God is doing now. And make no mistake, the things that happen in this story are awful right? Suffering happened, and it was real. And we can choose to look for the way God takes the threads of our pain and dysfunction and weaves it into our story to eventually make something we might call beautiful. And again and again, the story repeats the frame, God was with Joseph. And I'm certain that there were moments when Joseph struggled to believe that something good would come out of his situation. He wasn't left hopeless. That doesn't mean that God causes our challenges in order to test us. You can believe that if you want, but I don't. I choose to hold on to the hope that no matter how dark and tangled the threads of my life have become, that love can still find a way to weave something beautiful. God can find a way to bring something good out the other side if we choose to trust. Can you imagine choosing to love your worst enemies in such a way that it brings them to life? Joseph showed love for his brothers in such a way that it brought life to them and their children, despite the fact that they had sold him into human trafficking as a slave. But in the end, Joseph and his alienated kindred are able to forgive and reconcile. And what was torn apart by jealousy and anger and scarcity mindset was repaired with forgiveness. And while nothing could change what happened, the ability to forgive was what changed the outcome. We live in a world where divisiveness is almost always either in our face or just around the corner. Social media posts, family discussions, they turn ugly with one bad sentence. And there are so many things happening to us all at once. Upcoming elections, partisan rancor, the pandemic, the recession, 
Each one of these things are pounding away at each of us. So you add to that our own personal problems and our relationships, and it's a lot to bear. Is it any wonder that all too often we find ourselves at odds with the people we work with, we live near, even the people we love? Love, unevenly applied, can lead to some disastrous outcomes. Giving in to a sense of scarcity, whether it's something like grain or a father's love. This can create divisions between people who would otherwise get along pretty well. We can't change the past, but with forgiveness we have a chance to change the future. It's the first step in freeing ourselves from the pain inflicted by someone else. And each one of us has to make our own peace with our journey, but the path ahead can be quite different when we let grace lead us down the road. Amen. Friends, I hope that you will go bravely and boldly into this world of confusion and pain. I hope that you will bring God's healing words of love and forgiveness to your neighbors. Know the power of mercy and grace in your life and use those wonderful gifts to serve God by serving God's people. Go in peace to love and to serve.